Pavel Tomanchuk is a senior research group leader at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. In early 2021, he became the director of the Central European Institute of Technology in Bruno. Pavel has been an EMBO member since 2016. He's very active on social media, discussing not only his research on evolutionary and developmental biology, but also science policy, preprints, peer review, and open science. Together with EMBO Press's Thomas Lemberger, we discuss these topics and artificial intelligence and a smattering of Central European science fiction. Welcome to the EMBO Podcast. Pavel began his undergraduate studies at Masaryk University in Bruno in Czechoslovakia and finished them at Masaryk University in Bruno in the Czech Republic. From there, he moved to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg for his PhD. I was uh, the very first uh, Eastern European uh, PhD student at EMBL, and um, you know I got to it by essentially seeing an advertisement at my, at my university. That was the Masaryk University in Brno, and um, yeah, I mean it was a really really long shot for me to to try to apply for this PhD program. I have to say that uh, I had essentially zero experience speaking English. So the job interview essentially was <laughs> my first uh, experience with speaking with people in English. I, I was reading books. I was very much into science fiction, so I could understand English and read English, but I didn't speak right. And the first person I was speaking to was Steve Cohen, Canadian with a very strong accent. So that was really fun. But people were very, very nice at EMBL and um, you know I've I've somehow um, uh, you know was lucky that Anne Frusi gave me a, a chance and it was really a good decision because it really uh, started my career and allowed me to build a really fantastic network of uh, friends and colleagues with whom I am in touch until this day. In the Afrusi lab at EMBL, Pavel discovered key regulators of polarity in early development. Years later, in a lecture available on YouTube called Open Science Practical Examples, Pavel told the story of how an early application of what we would now call open science played an important role in the success of his project. I think there was not even considered open science, really. I mean, it was not really uh, described as such, but uh, the story was like that, that I was essentially studying a, a gene in Drosophila, which is called uh, PAR1, which is a uh, homologue of a gene from C. elegans, or gene which was heavily studied in C. elegans. And, um, you know, very important um, step was to clone the gene. And I started to clone the gene, essentially. And uh, But it turned out to be an extremely complicated locus with many exons, introns, a lot of alternative splicing. And uh, so I benefited massively from the fact that Jerry Rubin at that time at Berkeley has started to sequence Drosophila genome. And they were doing that in at that point in a very uh, targeted manner. And they happened to sequence the region of Phosmid or I, f I forgot what they were sequencing, maybe a buck, which contained my gene, right? And so I was really able to just, you know, day after day to go to their website and uh, uh, download new sequences, which I was assembling myself and putting them together with my cDNA sequences. And that really facilitated uh, my my work, right? And so that was an example, a very early example of open science, because in genomics, it was mandated that the sequences which are made at the machines, essentially the next day, they became available on the internet. So that was really nice. I think it, it may be a little bit difficult for people today uh, to, to imagine what the alternative would have been at the time in, in 1997, 1996 or so, where, especially for a large complex gene, where you would have to go maybe chromosome walking or... You have to do it, it. It's as you described in in your other presentation. It's a project in itself. Asking asking the question: Is the gene there? But there was a bunch of thing about the fact that um, at that time the scientific community was actually very protective about the data, right? So it was not given, you know, that 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 the, that the project like that it was a, a NIH project or NHGRI project, right? It was not. Uh, really given, you know, that it will be executed like this. I mean, in the Drosophila research community, a lot of people were, you know, so to say, afraid, you know, that Jerry is going to sequence the Drosophila genome and keep the best genes for his postdocs, right? <laughs> 
but that didn't happen. <laughs> so, and, and and I guess that was such a positive experience that then you went to work with him at, at the University of California. It was part of it. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the major part of that was that uh, he visited EMBL uh, to give a general motors sponsored lecture, actually two lectures and uh, uh, great lectures, by the way. And at the time he was visiting the PIs, he was talking to the PIs and Anne Frussi was very generous. She gave me her slot with Jerry. And so I was able to speak speak to him and we were discussing my interests. And I was at that time really into genomics and I was proposing that we do something with DNA microarrays and he encouraged me to apply for his lab. So it's an example, you know, how Emble is such a focal point where many people come, they, they show up, they give a talk and uh, you can really have an opportunity to, because Jerry at that time was already a big star in science worldwide. I showed up in California in Berkeley with two suitcases and and Jerry was re- really generous. He paid for one week a hotel for me, but it's very hard to find a place in, in Berkeley in, in one week, especially if you have not really that much experience with America. But I was walking on the street the second day and I met two people from Amble, right? So... <laughs> That was actually really, really nice, you know, and, uh, you know, then, then when, when I, you know, I had to leave the hotel, I was actually spending a couple of nights with Peter Scheifler, who, you know, was very kind to offer me his house before I was able to find a place, right? So the network from EMBL was at that time really, I mean, it still, still is really enabling and kind of crucial for traveling scientists. Did you find there was a big difference between UC Berkeley and the MBL? Yeah, I mean, the difference is that uh, Amble was uh, much more open and much more uh, collaborative and, and communicating place. Uh, at Berkeley, you know, especially I was in the big uh, Howard Hughes lab, and which was relatively self-sufficient. And so, you know, communication with other labs was relatively limited. I mean, at least compared to what you experience at EMBL, it's actually absolutely the case. There was, in fact, on a life science campus in the LSA addition building, there was a floor which was occupied by two ex embel PIs, right? Rebecca Held and uh, Karsten Weiss. And that was an island of EMBL. They were very open, very collaborative. You know, they have had joint events. But there was not really that much happening uh, at Berkeley in, in general. Over time, it became better. I got to know some people and so on. But uh, these big labs were generally kind of uh, self-sufficient universes. California was great. I had uh, met uh, some fantastic people there. I've seen uh, half of the US that was really fantastic. It's been said, you know, that if you spend in the US more than five years, you kind of stay there forever. So I was roughly at that level. I think one of the reasons why I left was that I was not completely confident that the approach to healthcare in the US is compatible with my long-term survival. (laughs) Uh, So that was one of the reasons. Okay. But, but of course, you know, also like I actually, you know, also had a a family aging uh, parents uh, back in Czechia, you know, being on the other side of the planet, I wanted to come closer to them. And of course, Europe, you know, has offered, you know, uh, fantastic um, opportunities. I was actually interviewing only in Europe. So I think I was probably really decided to come back to Europe. But I would say, again, mainly because I knew that if I stay a little bit longer, I'm just put some roots into California and I will never leave (laughs) because it's a great place. And so, in 2005, Pavel resisted the siren song of California and returned to Europe to start a lab at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. That, in fact, is, is, the, is the place which surpasses both Berkeley and EMBL in terms of the communication between people. We have a really, really good interactive faculty, which is, since we are functioning similarly to MBL as an incubator, which is constantly renewing and changing, I am one of the kind of constants here, which is a little bit difficult life because your friends always leave. But but never, never, nevertheless, we managed and the directors here managed to really create an atmosphere where I, I say that any one of us is essentially almost able to substitute the other PI in giving his his or her talk, 
because we really know what the other people are doing. We discuss it every week during a PI chalk talk meetings. And that's something which we really cherish. We really attended religiously. We, in fact, recently increased the frequency of it because our faculty grew. And so even though it's a kind of for the junior people, a little bit of a judgment day, you know, they want it because they want the feedback, which is sometimes tough, but always very constructive. And so this kind of level of communication is something which I would like to bring to SATEC. This type of collaborative, cross-pollinating institutional culture must be promoted and enforced, sometimes with creative, if semi-coercive, methods. Kai Simons has been doing that at EMBL. He was uh, going around uh, cell biology with a bell, ringing it, making people come to seminars. And here at uh, CBG, so Kai stopped doing this, but uh, we we play music for the big <laughs> departmental seminars. We play play music throughout the institute on the terrible loudspeakers. So you actually really <laughs> want it to end. But anyway, it's it's a it's a very good way how to kind of announce to people that they should come down for a seminar. I think a very clear, very important aspect of that is also a regularity, right? Because you have to get into some kind of a rhythm where you think like a Friday afternoon are the postdoc and PhD student talks and you just go go there because you know it's going to happen, right? And and you have it like kind of put in your schedule on a weekly basis. Dresden's fertile and interactive intellectual environment shaped the next phase of Pavel's career. After a successful PhD and postdoc working on developmental genetics and genomics, his research interests turned towards biophysics. That happened definitely here in Dresden. So, so you know, Dresden is a home of a you know incredibly successful biophysics school, which has been you know established uh, primarily by Joe Howard and Frank Ulicher. and you know they have attracted really some fantastic junior people who have now spread all over Europe and even the world, right? So, so you know, I when I started working here, I was actually still doing genomics. And I had to defend it uh, kind of heavily. And but this whole, you know, strong environment in biophysics just uh, rubbed on me. And I, you know, started thinking in those terms. And I really, you know, had the opportunity to collaborate with some of the best people in the field, like recently with Stefan Grill. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been, uh, it's been kind of, I would say, inevitable. The, the, sh- the place where you, where you work shapes you, right? And so, you know, now when I, the last three years I am at SATEC, I mean, you know, about 20% of my time, nevertheless, you know, I am very familiar with their, with their research and their research technologically revolves around uh, structural biology and especially cryo-electron microscopy. And I'm really thinking, you know, about, about projects which would go in that direction and it's just natural. It's a, a, a bit of an abstract question, but when you, when you, since you have also an interest in, in theory, and some of your papers have started from discrepancies in theoretical models of development to to new genes and new genetic pathways and new physical constraints, is do you think we are close for this early phase of development, where clearly there are many different ways to achieve a limited number of shapes, from which then we will diverge into more stereotypical or more strictly um, genetic programs in, in later development. Do you think we're close to having a, a formal integrated theory of genetics and physics in early development? Well, I, that I would say probably not, not, not close, uh, because because the models which we are using are very tailored to the specific. Uh, developmental scenarios which we are studying and they are kind of very utilitarian, right? They are kind of essentially uh, testing uh, hypotheses which are either coming from experiments or, uh, you know, trying to maybe look in the, at the parameter space, which is maybe experimental and not even uh, accessible. But these models, they are very rarely uh, crossing scales, right? They are either, you know, operating entirely on the level of molecules or they are operating entirely on the level of cells or maybe even abstraction of cells as some kind of uh, abstract materials and so on. So, so I think that, that, that as a, you know, having a grand unified theory of early development is probably still quite far away. 
Nevertheless, you know, the, the theory becomes a really good tool, right? I am not a, I am absolutely relying on great collaborations with theorists or on collaborations with great theorists, which here in Dresden, we have the Center for Systems Biology, which is full of people who are actually really doing a pure biologically, let's say, inspired theory. And, and this interaction is really our major a weapon now, right? Because we can really, in the theoretical level, we can do uh, things, we can corroborate experiments, we can suggest new experiments based on uh, experimentation in the computers. So this is really great. So one clear thing is that you have this very diverse experience of collaborating with people in, in different areas of not just biology, but in other sciences and not just in, in the... Um, in the basic science itself, but also in the technological development, and of course at several different sites uh, throughout throughout the world, through very successful sites. And now you have this role um, as director of SATEC. So, first of all, not not everybody may be familiar with with the institution. So, could you tell us a little bit about what SATEC is, uh, where it is, and and uh, and what its goals are? Yeah. So the SATEC is the, it stands for the Central European Institute of Technology. It is a project which has been established about a decade ago from the European uh, Structure Funds. It is a consortium which uh, has uh, several partners. These partners have changed a little bit over the years, but now there are six partners, you know, four uh, major Brno universities and two research institutions. Uh, there are two big uh, sites, uh, two big buildings of, of SATEC, which are associated with the two big universities in Brno, the Masaryk University and the Technical University. And, and the institute is, the definition of it is really, it's an interdisciplinary place, right? So, so half of the, half of the research is essentially revolves around material science and half of the research revolves around life sciences and, uh, you know, my role as a as a, a director of the consortium, among others, is to actually also try to find the bridges between those two disciplines to try to see, you know, how we can leverage in particular, let's say, the technological approaches of material science in uh, life sciences. And, uh, you know, that's uh, actually a major challenge, right? And but what SATEC really is about, it's an institute which has the ambition to be uh, among the best in Europe, right? And we are in Brno in, you know, it's actually Central Europe, but people think about it as a Eastern Europe. Um, we are at the border between the Central and Eastern Europe, um, you know, which is, of course, you know, all these, these areas are scientifically a little bit less developed, but at SATEC, we want to forget about that. We want to really play the Champions League with all the rest. Okay, so we have to be very creative because we don't have the same budget like Barcelona, but, you know, we are, you know, working on it. And, and uh, just recently, you know, we are actually uh, trying to hire some new people, some really international people, people who are actually quite established, quite well known, you know, not the usual suspect of we would imagine would actually, you know, join institution like uh, SATEC. And it's pretty hard, but, you know, that's our ambition. We want to compete with the best. Thomas? Yeah, well, I, w I was interested to 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 hear a bit your thoughts on trying to to have communities that are very different in in their disciplines and and their way of thinking in interact uh, to have a a center that marries material sciences and and life sciences seems to be super challenging. So, what what's your experience in terms of how people communicate? Do they understand the different cultures? Maybe yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it is a challenge, right? I mean, basically, you know, this institution does exist for more than 10 years and there's been many attempts to make it work. And there are, of course, you know, some uh, bilateral projects between labs, you know, which are working in the material science or in technology development in microscopy or even electron mi microscopy and with the life science projects, you know, on the say Tech Master University side, but, but it's, it's, it's very, it's very hard to find them. What we are kind of also, uh, what I think is maybe important, you know, if I would say it like, like this, you know, if they haven't been found in 10 years, such projects, they, 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 then they don't exist, right? In these two areas among the two sets of the PIs, you know, basically they probably do not 
exist because the the pressure to find them and the incentives to you know make them happen has been so high you know that 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 everything which was there was probably discovered and 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 is either has been done or is is being done so the the only way how to boost it is to really recruit people directly at the border between those two disciplines and that's what we are doing now actually and i think this really has a massive potential you know to bring in people who have ambition to develop really advanced technologies absolutely from scratch from first principles which they can absolutely do at the SATEC uh, Technical U- University, which has all the equipment for that. They have a, a very, very advanced uh, nano manufacturing laboratory, which is, you know, comparable to a chip factory, you know, here in Dresden, it was AMD and Intel had a chip factory here, you know, it's, it's smaller, but they have the, the range of equipment is in, indistinguishable. They can do anything on the nano scale. Right. And that, but then we need people who are actually, who have motivation to use that kind of technology to solve questions in life science. And we are really targeting these kind of people, right? Who, 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 who come with the interest of using these advanced technologies, which are really uniquely available here and apply them to life science. And all that, you know, importantly kind of revolves around electron microscopy because Bruno is a big center of electron microscopy. We can put a number on it. 35% of electron microscopes around the world are built in Brno. There are three major companies. One of them you must have heard about, Thermo Fisher, which has a factory, you know, of 2000 people. And they are building these most advanced, most expensive cryo-electron microscopes, which everybody, you know, tries to buy and collect money for, right? And so this is all happening here in Brno, very, very high, high tech. They are extremely interested in research and development. And so we, we are really trying to also find people who can bridge between what we have in academia and the local uh, industrial electron microscopy power. That was Thomas Lemberger joining the conversation. Thomas heads innovation at Embo Press and is the project leader for Review Commons, Embo's platform for preprint peer review. Pavel and Oded Rehavi recently wrote a perspective in Nature Review's Molecular Cell Biology entitled, Who Did What? Putting out some ideas about how to improve the way author contributions are recognized in scientific papers. Oded suggested ditching the collective we for a narrative format, telling the story of who did what. To quote his example, substituting, we found that worms avoid garlic with the same statement in our proposed style. Oded found that worms avoid garlic. Pavel repeated Oded's experiments and obtained similar results. Pavel suggested the addition of granular author contributions throughout the paper. Like the bibliographical references, each author would be assigned a number so that, for example, we sequenced RNA, superscript number one, would tag the first author. I was in particular imagining a scenario, you know, where somebody in the field of genomics, you know, is a really great expert on multiple sequence alignment across genomes and has, you know, hundreds of genomics genome papers where he or she, you know, does, does precisely that. I mean, it's always the same figure, essentially, because the technology is so good, you know, the, the, the knowledge is so good that people turn to this lab to do this, right? At the same time, you know, such a person is never a first or last author on those papers, and, and it's relatively difficult to find out what they actually did, right? And so if you, if they are, for example, going for a job, right? I mean, it would be so much easier if the search, search committee can say, well, I mean, they have so many, all, all those papers, and in fact, you know, in all those papers, they do this, and so in that, they are, you know, world class, clearly, right? So, so that's one scenario where you can imagine, you know, this would actually help. With with Embo, we have a, a, a data curation workflow called Source Data, and we have experimented a little bit in, in this direction where authors can drag and drop their names onto specific experiments on the figure uh, to sort of say, you know, I did this Western blot, I, I did this mass spec. Do, do you think that could go, sort of go in the direction you are thinking? No, absolutely. I, I like that. I mean, I, I was actually not blissfully unaware of this when we were writing this, this piece. But, uh, but it's a, this is, in fact, I would say the most um, feasible way of implementing it. Uh, because, you know, there was a lot of discussion about this, you know, especially about 
how do you attribute uh, ideas? You know, this is going to create a conflict because people will say this was my my idea, and you know, you are not acknowledging that, and so on. But usually, if there is something is in the figure, then there is a physical experiment which has been done, and typically people should know who did that experiment. If you know. One objection was that, oh, there are so many experiments. I don't even remember who did it, right? I was like, I have a little bit of a problem with that. If you put something in a figure and you have no idea who actually did it. <laughs> so so then then I would say that this is really great, you know, and this, this would be, I think, technically also very easy. What I was imagining in the system which I was proposing is that uh, every, every line or every segment in the figure legend would have to would have the identifiers, the numbers of the authors who contributed to it. And this would be pretty simple. But, you know, I was also always seeing that as as something which can be implemented very easily with the existing tools which we have. It can be a hack. You can just simply replace some of the citations with the names of the authors and then you can just cite them as you cite literature, right? But then, you know, if people would actually pick this up, you know, then of course... Uh, publishers can develop a really nice elaborate ways how to implement it, how to hide it, how to highlight it, how to summarize it, and so on. Right. At the same time, we were also quite careful to to say that we don't want people to start counting percentages of you know I contributed four point five percent to that paper and then making some metrics out of it. You know that's that's not desired and and you know it's not the intention here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A sort of a parallel initiative. Uh, not as granular as, as what you proposed was this initiative of creating a, a data citation format where where the data sets themselves could be cited in a in a format and in a form that is very similar to to papers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that was really nice. I think the what is very valuable about this piece is the Twitter storm, which uh, was initiated from it because all these things have been pointed out there. There was a really funny, funny moment where the system which you described, which is called credit, you know, was <laughs> actually, you know, we, I was, didn't know about it. Odette didn't know, didn't know, know about it, but it's used by cell press and Odette published several cell papers. So he should know about it. <laughs> <laughs> I at least could say that I didn't publish a cell paper, so I don't know. <laughs> It's but anyway, but, but you know, it was all kind of this the the discussed in the thread, the, the the pros and cons, and and you know, it was actually quite revealing. In the meantime, you know, I've made one attempt to make a pilot, um, and it hasn't really happened yet. So it's relatively difficult to convince people to actually play along with this, and that you know was one of the criticisms. And I agree, it's difficult. <laughs> uh, but I am not giving up. I have an idea, you know, how to how to make it almost inevitable that it will have to be used. But I will not say. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I really like about the smart figure idea that kind of ties together to your model, uh, Pavel, of the author credit is um, is that we can say, actually, this small piece of data in a, in a 12 figure paper, this guy managed to measure this protein in this cell in real time, which no one had ever done before. And then there are 40,000 citations of that paper, but 35,000 of them are about that piece of data, right? Um, so it really says that was the valuable contribution. And when it's something really cutting edge and technically difficult to do, or I just saw a wonderful talk by Thomas Bond on these angler fish, when it's something where it's a specimen that's really hard to get, sometimes the standalone piece of data is very important. And the second standalone piece of data to show that a rare data set is in fact reproducible is incredibly valuable, right? But right now we have no way to credit that unless the person puts it in the format of a paper. But I really want to see the next person that observes what, what Thomas saw, the Thomas Bohm, that these anglerfish have lost the huge chunk of their immune system and seem to be, you know, it's, it's a very, or it could be for a rare, a rare cell type people who pull out the cells that are residing in adipose tissue where you have a hundred cells that look very significant. I really want to see the second lab that did that, which is usually the lab that got scooped at doing something technically difficult, right? So that figure one or that figure two usually disappears into a drawer. And it really tells us something very important about reproducibility. And it also allows people who do f modeling, for example, to, to progress. There was a huge discussion about why the machine learning models and why the AI learning models are doing so poorly on human data is just because there's not a lot of public data out there 
to train the models on, right? So there, I think there has to be beyond the credit for the things that are in the paper. We we need to start thinking about giving credits, uh, not making perhaps. I mean, this is my opinion, but n- not having to tie the uh, credit that then determines people's career progression exclusively to what's in a paper, right? Because now we do have the ways to make those things available. Well, in 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 going back to way the beginning of your story, the the, the database was more important than the, the papers at the time uh, for getting your project actually moving forward, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been the idea around to to limit the amount of papers which any given lab can publish in a year, like to give essentially the lab a slot, you know, a couple of slots where they can where they can present, you know, what is new uh, in their research, you know, in a given year, right? And could accumulate, of course, projects because most projects take six years. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so so that I've, you know, I've. I think it's not really such a bad idea. And then what you were discussing, you know, like that some things might be just simply a data set or some you know, measurement, something really atomic, you know, maybe, maybe that doesn't even have to be reviewed, peer reviewed, right? Because, you know, what do you say about that, right? I mean, you haven't done the experiment, you know, it's, you know, it, it could be wrong because somebody has put the wrong buffer in there, right? But you will probably not be able to really say, right? And then, you know, there's not much to, not much else to say about it if you are not allowed to talk about impact or you're not allowed to talk mm-hmm. about uh, about uh, I don't know the, the 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 amount of the work it's just the work right you know then then let's just not review it right and then maybe journals could and because you know then then it would be only preprint and that's really difficult to sell in your CV and whatever. Well, maybe journals could actually adapt to it also because we are the scientific community is always adapting. Maybe journals can adapt as well and say, well, we have in our journals, we have papers which are peer reviewed and which are not, you know, which we just say, okay, this was, this was done. It's small. You know, we looked at it, looks correct, published, right? It is an interesting thought. So, so one idea that is floating around is to have maybe a different kind of peer review, um, which would be something like a technical uh, peer review for a data set, for a protocol, for a method where where you would really scrutinize the methods, the benchmarking, the performance, the coverage, the accuracy and, and, and these kind of things, which does not obligatorily need then the, the five hours or, or the entire day of deep thought about, you know, how this piece of work in, in inserting the rest of the knowledge and could also maybe um, then benefit from the help of, of younger peer reviewers. Uh, who are postdoc who really know their stuff at the technical level w- without obligatory being able to to take the 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 distance to provide you know more general insights what what do you think about this idea well i think in general you know like uh, expanding the the pool of peer reviewers is is definitely needed right so i think everybody should be able to review that's where i also think you know that maybe places like review commons or elife they could actually remove some of the objections which I hold towards their role as a gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. It comes a little bit also from the fact, you know, that their editorial boards are really very selective, right? I mean, I have been kind of pointing out, for example, that that at EMBO and also at eLife, there is extreme lack or paucity of uh, editors from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. It's almost like we don't exist, right? And that's you know, maybe, maybe this could be changed by, by not even having, you know, having, having editors is very valuable, but, but, you know, have, reviewing editors should be in principle anyone, right? I don't think that there needs to be this kind of, you know, club. With review comments, as you know, we, we ask, um, reviewers to, to review preprint and, and the reviews are posted online next to the preprint. Do you, do you have any thoughts about how to to incentivize reviewers or how to reward them and 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 so what kind of credit we could assign to them? Okay, so now we moved to the <laughs> to the most let's say relevant uh, topic of this discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, I I have been kind of very vocal about this on Twitter. Uh, I think that the best way of incentivizing reviewers is to pay them. Mm-hmm. I know that it's very difficult proposition, which has some kind of 
you know, let's say moral dimension, but also economic, you know, that, that it would once again, you know, where will the money come from and will this make publishing even more expensive than it already is and it will eventually be pulled out of the budgets of the people who do the work and so on, right? But I really think that, uh, you know, reviewing, I mean, you know, in particular, we are talking about reviewing for uh, a service which focused on the delivery of the review, like the review comments, right? I mean, I think the reviews which are being prepared for re review comments are of a very different kind, you know, because they are from the very beginning to be seen basically publicly. So people, even if your name is not attached to it, you know, it's, it's people can make really good guesses, right? And so it's essentially a publication by itself, right? I mean, you really craft it so that it is uh, comprehensive, makes sense, it's logical, it's polite enough and, and so on, right? So you put a really lot of effort, right? And then, you know, I don't know how much people agree or disagree with that, but there are two school of thoughts on how people review, right? I mean, some people will tell you, well, you know, you should not spend more than one hour reviewing a paper, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then some people will say, when I review a paper, I take the whole day, right? And in both cases, you know, it's like, you know, it's a one day of your academic life, right? And, and you will not get that day back. You know, and, and even the hour, if you do it even in one hour, you know, you probably are reviewing many more, right? So these hours, they will actually, you know, multiply. And so, you know, putting this all together, I think that it would really help to motivate people to review well, you know, to do a thorough job. And to also deliver the reviews on time, because I mean, you are, <laughs> you are publishers, you must have really massive experience with that, with people like me, you know, who deliver the reviews very, very late, right? So, so that, you know, if you do something and you are, you know, rewarded for it, you are paid for it, you are much more, um, let's say, motivated, you know, to hold the deadlines and so on. So mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. this is a good idea. And I wish somebody comes up with a gr brilliant idea how to make it economically viable. Mm -hmm. When you are in the traditional journal model, right, and you and you ask for something to review, you are fully expecting that the review will be made. You will read it, the authors will, will read it, maybe the other reviewers will read it, the paper will be rejected, and this thing will never be seen again. Never, never will see the light of day, right? But so, so in principle, yeah, you have to, you know, you have to commission probably, you know, in a very selective journals, 10 times more reviews than what you actually publish, right? But with, with the services like Review Common or what eLife is doing now, right? I mean, the, the, the purpose is really to get the review. Once you make the decision, the review will be done, right? And so, you know, then you will pay for something which will be actually published, right? So maybe that's a difference and maybe that one could exploit some somehow. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's fair and it's certainly a, a matter of fact that it's a difference. The The question is whether, you know, wh what is it that we should review? Should we review any manuscripts? Should we review any manuscript where the authors just are ready to pay whatever the content of the manuscript? Where, how, how do you see that? How to decide what is what is meaningful to be to be reviewed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, I think I... I in fact, hold the view that um, there needs to be some uh, selectivity, right? I mean, uh, especially especially because you know there are very different science communities and very different scientists, and 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 some people will play the system and use their opportunities, right? And artificially, in you know, in some national systems, numbers of publications is all that matters. So the more you more number of papers you publish, the better scientist you look like in the eyes of the local funders. And so then you don't think about whether it is a publishable unit, you think about I need a plus one paper. And so then you actually send it somewhere. And if the service which provides the peer review is kind of obliged to look at it and find the reviewers and, and re review your atomic piece of science, which actually simply is not a complete story and it's just some measurements which you know are maybe are maybe correct and maybe even important you know maybe even interesting to some number of people but you could do much more and put together a much more comprehensive story right and so somebody should decide you know whether what is being submitted is enough science to be peer-reviewed and to be published right 
And so I would, I think that selectivity is, is important. I'm not making this argument so much like we need the journals to tell us what to read because there is so much of it, right? I think we need the journals to regulate, you know, what is the publishable unit of science. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts in just coming back, you know, to the reward of, of reviewers? They should be rewarded if the reviews are good. But now, as we know, sadly, there is some kind of variability in the quality of the reviews. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, what constitutes a good review and, and how we can maybe objectivize a little bit this assessment of the quality of the reviews? Okay, so, I mean, I, I thought, maybe I will first answer the question which I thought you will ask and then we will come to your question, <laughs> right? So, so because I think, you know, that if somebody, if we have, imagine we have a system where we pay for the reviews and somebody delivers uh, a bad review, not not negative, but just bad, you know, not sufficiently thought through, very short, you know, clearly hasn't read it, hasn't maybe understood it or hasn't tried, you know, I mean, then the editor has totally uh, a freedom, right, or maybe even a duty not to select that person again, right, which will completely cut that person from the from the revenue stream from the review. <laughs> so, so I think that system is self-regulating that I would say, right. But, but, uh, but your question was, was then turned a little bit in a different uh, di direction. Well, so, so this is indeed what we do, you know, every day. If but deciding, a, yeah, but deciding a, 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 whether a, a, the review is good, how to make it of objective where the review is good well how to 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 compare the quality of these reviews if we imagine that we pay reviewers uh, and I, I i don't really agree with the idea of paying but I, i can see the logic but we can also think about assigning some form of academic credit to reviewers these systems then have to be sort of coupled to uh, a minimum amount uh, a minimal quality of the review job so it has to be controlled And if this has to be controlled, one should have, you know, as much as possible objective criterion of what is a good review. Is it a long review? Is it a review that covers the entire paper? Well, how, how do we judge that? It becomes then as subjective as, as evaluating the quality of a paper, if you want. And, and we may fall in the same traps. So I, I don't know if you have thought about this issue. I mean, I haven't really thought about it much, but... but uh you know, <laughs> who reviews the reviewers, right? Exactly. <laughs> the okay. editors review the reviewers. So yeah, the editors are maybe, maybe the, obviously yeah. once again, you know, like maybe not the, the gate gatekeepers here, but, but like a, uh, judges of, of the quality and, and, but of course, you know, their opinions about the, the quality of the reviews will be subjective, right? I mean, what, what I, what I find interesting sidestepping the question a little bit, but maybe we'll get back to it is uh, that as review comments, so the re reviews are collected, you know, they, they will be posted uh, publicly alongside the, with the with the preprint, but then there will be also the response of the authors, right? And so, you know, essentially the authors are then reviewing the reviews in a sense, right? So they are, you know, and and that's maybe, you know, where where I would say that what, what, I, what I find really the most, you know, the most uh, difficult and time consuming and time wasting effort is to write the response to reviewers comments, which can sometimes be much longer than the paper itself, which is, you know, littered with the pleasantries about how genius the comments are, you know, before saying that they are complete nonsense, you know, and then, and then, you know, so, so maybe Technologic is technologically streamlined, streamlining this a little bit by, because no, nobody can read all this text and nobody really can, right? So, so even the US editor, you probably don't even read it, right? So, so the, and, and sometimes the reviewers, when they get it back, they don't even read it because they are saying like, no, I don't even want to read this document, right? So, so maybe thinking about like that the reviews are now the, the, the response to the, to the paper and now the authors, you know, they could kind of insert their comments on top of the, on top of the reviewers comments without all the fluff, right? Just saying, you know, for that sentence, you know, like you don't have to go to several different documents on, you just look at the review and then, you know, most of the sentences are 
untouched, but somewhere the authors say, well, you know, this is a good idea. We will try to do this. Or, you know, this is not a good idea. This is why, and we will not do this, right? This is patently wrong. That person didn't understand, right? Or sometimes this is a great idea. Thank you very much, right? Things, things like this. So that you, that we don't propa- don't, don't make this hierarchy of documents, which people have to kind of, you know, read through. And which, which is, I think not happening, right? It's, it's really not happening. I have, I have never done it myself and I don't think I will, I ever will. I would like to maybe bring another point, you know, what about AI? You know, I think that, uh, in, in fact, you know, this sort of, uh, judgment of, of whether your piece of work is, is, uh, novel, right. And whether it kind of, you know, pushes the, the, the state of the art or whether it's something which is simple that it has some aspect of it are not known. Right. I mean, I think AI is in the, almost the best position to, to judge that, right. Because, because we are, we have, we are making these judgments based on our imperfect memory of reading the literature in the past. Right. And, and we are not remembering exactly what was written in those papers. We did, we are filtering it through our imperfect brains. Right. And then we are making judgments, right? But very often we just really have not read, you know, 95, 99% of the literature, we just don't know, right? And then, and then the AI has access to it all the time. You know, it, it, it has access to it once and it will never forget, right? So, I mean, of course, it would have to be trained appropriately just mm-hmm. on scientific literature, but it could at least assist the editor, right? I had this idea that for a science fiction story that in the future, you know, editors are going to be totally AI, right? That's, that's, the institutes are going to work on their projects, you know, sheltered from the AI metaverse, right? Because, because the AI is generally like far ahead in the thinking as opposed to the humans, but the humans have to do something. So, you know, they are doing this, right? And then they, when they submit it, you know, they, they, they pour these petabytes of, of data into the metaverse and the AI entities, they look at it. And in a couple of microseconds, they say either in or in. <laughs> Pavel, so, Pavel, I have to reveal a secret. Uh-huh. We, we have autonomous artificial aid uh, since 10 years. We just didn't tell anybody. <laughs> 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 but but I think you know I think that there could be really some some value to it right and if if one could actually you know some organization like like Embo or eLife could do some research in, in into it mm-hmm. because it seems like a, like the AI is you know doing really uh, mm-hmm. has made a really great progress and you know right now it's unconstrained with respect to scientific literature so it makes stuff up. But if it would be constrained, right? Maybe mm-hmm. yeah. because I, I see, I see, like in my field, there are papers which are forgotten, right? I mean, I have not forgotten because they were published before I was born, right? And then you start searching, 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 and suddenly you find that paper where where everything you believed is shown beyond doubt by electron microscopy to be wrong, you know, and it has six citations, so everybody forgot, you know, but the AI would not forget. No, I, I think it's it's really an interesting thought. And um, I, I think there are probably many scenarios we can envisage, you know, a, a useful uh, use of, of AI. It doesn't need to be immediately, you know, the, the artificial autonomous editor making very difficult decisions. It can also be a, at a lower level. For example, for, for what I mentioned about um, technical checks, uh, checking the statistics, checking the experimental design that is probably a minimal really already now to, to AI and there are already commercial products that go in this direction. In terms of making decisions, you know, that are more in the direction of the significance of a paper, its novelty, um, the contribution uh, to the field, it's still a bit early days. What I like with the principle is that if it's done in conjunction with a human, one provides a control to the other and not obligatory the human provides a control to the machine, but also the machine provides a control to the human. As we know, we sometimes we sleep le- less than, than, than necessary or we're in a bad mood or we didn't eat very well and our judgment is, is affected. And in a way, the machines are immune to that. So they, they can reveal biases or, or, or tendencies or erratic behavior of humans. On the other hand, I think the wisdom 
of an expert such as you to to match that with AI. It it's not yet very clear that that this is going to happen. And maybe it happens, but I think it's difficult to measure or to control. Mm -hmm. But the future will tell. It's true that it's going very fast. I I totally agree with you that and I I think it's at this point definitely it will be an assistive tool, right? But uh, but you know it, the, the 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 decision of the editor might be much easier, you know, if it sees like that you know scale 1 to 10, you know, AI ranks this paper 9.8 and you know this paper 2, right? So there's something going on there, right? And you can have a look into it. But what I what I would say if that happens, what is really important, and okay, so I'm not an expert here, but I can imagine this, right? What is really important is that that expert system, that, that network, which is doing the, des- which is helping you make the decision, that has to be completely closed. No open science. Right? Mm-hmm. Because the moment you actually reveal how you train it, you know, then the others will train the networks to manipulate it and to write papers in a way that that network will score it high, right? Well, they, they will surely build a network to try to re- reverse engineer this. Yes, current. exactly. Right. And so that I was recently talking about it kind of also live in this kind of a discussion that, that it might, in fact, we might be at the really like a big uh, sort of transition in academia and, and in science, right? Because, because in the, we, we might actually, you know, live in, the, in the, we are be the generation which will actually write papers to be consumed by AI, not by humans. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And that, I, I, we have to start thinking about how to write such papers. You know? <laughs> Just looking at the, the larger shape of science, especially at the very high end, at how waves of fashion sweep through, you know, at any given point, somebody's making a joke about which kind of papers can get published where, you know, that you can do single cell sequencing of this or 20 years ago that you would do signal transduction of that or there in between there is the micro yeah. yeah. And <laughs> so I, I would really worry that uh, just given the history that the system would have to be um, designed with that in mind, actually, because uh, the, the reinforcement learning potential there to get captured in the, the reigning trends is, is, is huge. And, and the kind of AI approaches have a history of, of falling in, in, into those I, traps. I was always thinking in that sense, you know, that, that uh, the, the quality of the paper is best judged by its uh, citation performance, which requires a little bit of time, of course. You know, now it's also with, with the AI, you can really, really do some very good extrapolation also from the early behavior because the amount of data is really incredibly high, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's crazy, right? And then, and then, you know, like that, it can be, everything can be field normalized. I mean, if something is extremely, um, fashionable, it is very ha- difficult to publish a paper which stands out, right? Because, because everything in single cell sequencing is cited like crazy. And, and so, you know, I think that it could, you know, if there is a really clever system of identifying what the subject is, right? And that is a continuum, right? And now the AI can totally encompass that small universe, right? And, and it could kind of figure out, you know, is this an outstanding piece of work which people really uh, kind of you know, use for their further research, right? And that would bring me back to the idea of uh, that, you know, that this goes a little bit in the direction of post-publication peer review, but I, I, unlike Mike Eisen, I don't want to abolish journals. So what I'm thinking is that journals should become a little bit more flexible in their kind of assignment of the paper, right? So I was, for example, uh, uh, suggesting that eLife should, divide itself into eLife 1 to eLife 10. And then when they, when they publish a paper, you know, they make some, I mean, before the, the current system, they make some editorial decision, right? They say, this is piece of work, which we would judge to be eLife 4, you know, it's slightly below average, right? But then in three, three years, you know, it becomes uh, one of the highest cited papers in the field, right? So it should be moved into eLife 9 or eLife 10, right? The, their best level, right? And, you know, because at the end, you know, people are judged by where they publish, right? No matter what, because nobody can read everything, right? But right now it's a very proxy, you know, it has to be a, a big name, right? But, mm. 
but you know this could come, come provide a very very easy um immediate immediate in indication of how the paper has been actually doing you know whether it was going up for it, you know had passed through the peer review very badly right but then it was going up for it, or it was a stellar considered completely stellar work but nobody really was interested in in the context of of the field and it just dropped down and it's forgotten right so maybe it's a different different topic but i think something like that is also kind of needed you know to yeah. understand you know how does the paper do after it is peer reviewed yeah. no and and you can you can weigh it as you say by different fields or or, or different areas so for example you you're on a paper that has uh, it's approaching i think 50,000 citations for for Fiji right so say the, the importance of technological development or if now we're looking for someone to set a new field conceptually and so forth you can you can sort of apply different filters once you've automated the system that's a good example fiji is an outlier so it you know i think even in the context of similar kind of papers it's been cited a lot right because we really struck the nerve there and it's been for decades uh, used ev everywhere but but sometimes it's much more continuous you know i think like mm -hmm genome papers you know they are cited a lot right but usually you know all of them right so you can you can really discriminate a little right so if something is was particularly well done or particularly mm -hmm. important genome or the way they they did it or the way they analyzed it interesting you know i i don't know i mean it's always a yeah. little bit of a proxy right of course right and nothing is perfect yeah. right? but then if the ai would put would go into that you know and not just take the number of citations, but also understand, you know, what is citing it, right? This is now beyond us, right? I mean, we cannot look at this. Even if we dimensionality reduce it, we, we probably are not very well positioned with our brains to, to judge this, right? But if the AI can look at it and, and look at this kind of massive graph of who cites what, you know, it can really identify, you know, this paper, there is something in it, which is incredibly important, right? No, and no, then, that's, that's and then when everybody then, does who did what, like we, we suggested this, this or that, you can get to the point with you, Tiago, where we're actually talking about of identifying within that paper, what is the interesting part, right? Maybe it's not the whole paper. Maybe it's really yeah. this one method or this one antibody, right? You know, which would, of course, you would have to then cite not only, not only the paper, but what in the paper makes you cite it, right? <laughs> which good luck because most people cite paper they haven't read. <laughs> no, and 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 I think that it's not so hard to introduce also quality of citation in there. Just to give you an example, of what I mean in this kind of late night at the at the conference bar kind of setting, you know, when editors start talking about high profile rejections, like say the arsenic uh, life paper, in the short term and where the uh, impact factor is measured, that increases citations by like thirty percent or something to have something that everyone is talking about. But it's everyone is talking about it negatively. That's um, that's not so challenging for for the current. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that was a problem. Yeah, you are absolutely right. That that was a problem before that one could simply it could be a really wrong paper, but it's cited because it's wrong, right? But AI can really detect that. There's no doubt. I want to end just on a, a lighter cultural note, because at the beginning of the interview and at the end of the interview, you, you mentioned science fiction, of, of which you're a fan. And I, I was uh, wondering if you recommend any any Czech or, uh, authors of science fiction to, to ah, everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah great. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. That, that's, a, that's a nice question. Thank you. <laughs> so I have been a little bit, I mean, Czech science fiction uh, community is really active. You know, we are, they are organized, we are, I mean, I used to be part of it. Now I'm removed for many years, but we were organizing uh, uh, conventions, you know, they, they were really fantastic. There are, you know, journals, there's a lot of uh, short stories. There are, there are prizes every every year. Somebody wins the, the lizard, the block of, of Karel Čapek, right? So of course, Karel Čapek is the, you should read Karel Čapek, right? That's that's the RUR, you know, the robots. Mm -hmm. That's where the robots come from. By the way, he, even though he was the writer, it was his brother who suggested to the word robot, Right. And it's, it's a Slavic word. It's for, for hard work. It's a robot, robota, right? So then mm. it, his robots were 
were you know made of of metal so he was imagining that they can do something very heavy so they said call them robots right anyway so but i would i would like to really highlight if there's anything of that is uh, translated there is a guy called andre neff n e f f and he's this guy i read almost everything he wrote he's a very good very funny he is also like a massive internet uh, blogger the first blogger i would say yeah like, when I was at EMBL, when nobody was blogging, Andre Neff was already blogging every day. It was amazing. I was reading his stuff. I was, re- I was learning about what's going on in Czechia through his blog. But he writes very good science fiction. I don't think it's internationally known, so he probably is not that much translated. Yeah. To explore Pavel Tomanchak's research and open science resources, visit his lab's page at mpi-cbg.de. To learn more about the Central European Institute of Technology, go to satec.eu. The Czech Republic is part of EMBO's Increasing Participation Initiative. Visit our webpage to find out about the opportunities afforded by the program and which countries are eligible. To submit a manuscript to Review Commons or browse its collection of reviewed preprints, go to reviewcommons.org. Thank you for listening to the EMBO Podcast.